Welcome back everyone. In the last two videos, we built up our ECS framework. Now we're going to integrate this into Fungi and actually make it part of our little game engine. So there's a kind of a lot of loopy, and we're going to build some new actual um, components and systems. Um, and th these components and systems really just put replace functionality that already pre-existed in Fungi. Like I said, we're replacing um, a lot of our um, renderables and um, a render object, a transform object, all that stuff is going to be replaced with components and systems. So in Fungi, I now have I got rid of let's say let's in say data there was the transform object that's gone. The, the, the transform doesn't exist anymore, and the render folder is gone. Um, but we do have now is components. So I have a camera component, a drawable component. A drawable component is basically our renderable. I just decided to rename it, make it a smaller word to type out, and our transform component. And in our systems folder, we have render system and our transform system. Um, and added to it, we also have a file called API, which I'm not going to probably explain in this video. In the next video, I'll explain it. And we have the app JS file and our ECS file it exists here as well. Um, in the previous version of Fungi, there used to be a file called here called system, and system would basically have our launch code that starts up um, fungi, to, you know, finds the canvas, it um, creates the context and everything else. So since I don't want to confuse that system with actual systems, I decided to rename it to app.js. So it's kind of the fungi app file and it, it kind of just launches the application. And actually when I was here, I decided to rewrite it and actually make it a lot, I think, better. Like it's actually, to me, it functions a lot better and it's um, easier to um, handle. And right now it's only three functions long. I think the previous version was a lot bigger. So it's really simple. Um, so we pass in our render callback. Remember, like, so we can do our render loop and we pass in our download list. So if I go back here and look at our test page, um, this is what it looks like now. And it's it's almost like that. It's very similar to how it used to look like, um, except now instead of system that prepare whatever, um, now it's called app.launch. So app.launch, I, pa I pass it in null because I don't have an on render function right now. And then I can add a list of resources I want to download. And when it's all done, it runs that. If there's an error during the process, it runs catch. So these are, these are promises. These are uh, part of the async uh, functionality. Because uh, this is async, it, async functions create promises and prom basically I'm making kind of like a thread. So everything is asynchronous. So right here, I just start up this load the resources if I'm actually requesting the resources to be loaded and um, launch GL. And our GL code is pretty simple. It's, it's not much has changed. Uh, it just initiates the, the canvas and creates our transforms. Um, the one thing you might notice there is a new, not transforms, uh, UBOs, uh, uni uniform buffer objects. There's a new uniform buffer object I'm creating calling UBO model. Um, instead of uploading the model matrix and the normal matrix to our shader, for every individual shader, I'm actually gonna upload everything into our, into a model, uh, into a UBO. Um, why am I gonna do that now? Um, simply because um, there are sometimes we need to do multi passes on specific objects, which might require more than one shader. So instead of like, let's say if I want to make a, like an outline of a character, I need to s render the, the, the vertices twice, one for the outline and one for the actual th the character. So I need to run the same model matrix twice. Um, so it'd be just easier if I just upload to um, Upload it to an MBO, and this way I don't have to call it twice. So if I have a lot of characters that uses like a multi-pass um, shaders, then this will help streamline the process a little bit because I only need to pass it in once, and then I can run all the shaders that based on that one specific model. So, and UBO, and UBO got an upgrade. Um, in this video, I'm probably not going to explain it really much to it now. Uh, UBO has changed. There's some bug fixes. Um, the biggest change now is that originally, when I would when you'd update the UBO, it would pass the data straight into the, which would upload it straight into the GPU. Uh, it doesn't do that anymore. Right now, when you do an upload, it actually saves it to a byte buffer that exists in the UBO object. So when the UBO object is created, it creates a, a, a byte buffer, 
basically it's the representation of what's on the GPU. So this way I can do a bunch of changes to my local byte buffer and then upload it to GPU. Because I was noticing when I was using UBOs, I was changing like several values for one UBO at a time. And then I would have to upload to the GPU several times. So this way I modify the data uh, several times and then I only upload it once. So uh, again, it's to make more efficiency. And I created a very simple byte buffer object that kind of handles it. So this is more of a JavaScript thing and not a WebGL thing, so I'm not going really to explain it too much really. But like I said, it's just using the data buffer and a data view object. So this way I can use it as a byte array. So that's all it is. Um, so I can use, so I can, because all the data that we are sending to GPU is basically binary data. It's just arrays of bytes. So I create an object that let, lets me manage that in JavaScript. So, so that's UBO. So this way, UBO has been um, made more efficient. Um, I don't know if I, I don't like I said, I'm not going to bother making a video about it because it's so small. And it's really more JavaScript. It's more of optimization. So we have four UBOs or three UBOs: one for the transform, uh, one for lighting, and one for model. So that's that's what we need to launch uh, our GL um, context and everything else. And um, our launch also creates some default assemblages. Um, transform and drawables are not loaded in. They are being downloaded dynamically by using assemblages. So over here, I can kind of see, let's see, UBO, register component, transform, and drawables. So like I said, remember in a previous video, I said assemblages, I have it built. So this way, if it, the component doesn't exist, it automatically downs it for us. So this way, I don't have to load it up in here. The only thing I have to load up is systems, but I can add, I can make systems also load up the same way in the future. So they're they're more dynamic. Um, so once I have the assemblages and the components all done, that's why I have an await class, and that's why this thing is an async, because I'm doing a lot of asynchronous things. Um, I start adding systems. So I have the transform system and the render system. And when all said and done, I just to save some global objects to the fungi object, which I'm going to save components and assemblages so, so I can access them dynamically, globally, anywhere, just by calling fungi. And I'm creating a camera. And the camera is just a new entity, and I'm making it manually. I'm not making an assembly because I don't need to make the camera that often. So this is more of a manual. So I'm just manually creating the camera object. It has a transform and has a camera component. Um, and this is how we set position now. Like I said, um, when I, when you add a component, instead of making an array, I make it a, a property. So this way I can access transform directly. And I have set position. And then um, camera, as you can see, has a... Um, is both a component and a, a, an object with static functions. You'll see in a minute, and it's functional programming. So, I'm I'm saying set projection, and I'm passing in the data. So, gotta remember the component is data, and this is a function, and that function just updates that data. So there's a like I said, there's a separation. So before I would just say fungi that camera set projection, not in this version. Camera is now a, like this. This is a static function, and I just update the, the actual data for camera load resources hasn't changed so it's all the same um, maybe the small little fix in here or there but overall follows the same premises of downloading things dynamically if we don't need it because if we don't need to download resources there's no point in importing all these objects into memory uh, and that's launch so this is how the application starts up I like I said it looks a little neater um, so that's app we don't need app anymore uh, now we're going to look at some of our components. Um, we have drawable. And if you remember our renderable, we would have a VAO, the draw mode, what material, and some options. So all that, that, comp that really was mostly just what, it, what a renderable was, is now re reduced to just four bits of information. And that's, this is what a component that is. Um, now we also have the transform component. Now this looks a little different. Now because this one, I am now breaking the pure ECS idea. This is now more of a hybrid ECS because even though I do have pure data here, I set some of these as basically the idea of private. I don't want to modify these directly if I don't need to. 
um, simply because I want to have a dirty um, attribute. I want to know when data has changed. So when I, when I perform all the transform for the model view, I will only want to do it when it's been modified. So if, you, if the object hasn't moved, changed its scale, or its rotation has not changed, I don't want to recalculate the model view. So to do that. So to make it possible, I have these getters and setters. So if I use one of these getter setters to modify the data, it automatically sets the value to is modified. So this way, it, it, it's easier. Now, even though I have these as private, it doesn't necessarily mean I don't, I can't access, I can't modify these directly, and I will use, actually modify these directly sometimes. This is kind of where you kind of cross the line between functional programming and object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming means this is private, you should never modify this outside of the object. In functional programming, this is just data. That's all, it's just data and data, whatever, whichever way you want to say it. That means you can modify. You pass this this data, data object to the function and it will modify how it sees fit. The only thing, like the only thing you have to remember, like I, I have to remember as a developer, is that if I modify these things manually, I have to update the is modified func um, property as well. I have to say, so if I change the position, I have to make sure that this set is true as well. If I don't, there will be a bug in the system where the up the, the position won't won't change because the model view is not being updated based on this this property. So that's why I have these functions in there, so these these getters and setters, and and actually three functions. So this way, I don't I can modify the data easy without worrying about this because, like I said, doing it um, manually functions you can create bugs so so this so this is more of a hybrid uh, ECS type of um, component I can use it as a purely functional data thing but it also has a little bit of fun um, logic built in but very little it's really just logic built to manage data to prevent errors basically that's all it is so this is this is what my transform object. Remember, our transform object used to be huge; it was massive, because I all this stuff had to be private, and I had to build tons of functionality to use it efficiently. So now, like I said, I can actually access it directly as long as I remember to modify this. So I can actually make my transform object a lot smaller, and I just have some simple getters and setters to make life um, a little bit easier. And I have these set functions. Just like our old transform with return this, so this way I can still chain because that's one of the things I love about object-oriented languages. I can easily chain data, um, I chain functionality, so I can write less code. So that is our transform component, and now we have now our camera component, which all it is is just some of our matrices that that used to exist in our camera object, and. Um, this contains three static objects that uses that can, uh, that I have to pass in the camera component too. So if I want to get the projection, I have to pass in the camera component data, and then it just calculates the value and it returns back the projection view matrix. And set projection and set orthographic. Um, like again, you have to pass in the com and it does it. So. Uh, normally, you wouldn't see this in other languages, but like uh, um, I think because this might screw up certain things you can do, uh, like serializing beta, uh, de um, serializing binary data, um, uh, CPU cache. Like you wouldn't want to add all the, some of this functionality to this struct. Um, but since I can't use any of those. Uh, things in JavaScript, might as well just dump them in there and make life easier instead of creating another object called like ut camera util that has these four, three functions. Or I just make really long functions like camera auth orthographic or set camera projection and then have them export out individually as functions for fun as fun fun functional programming. Um, so like I said, this is kind of more of a hybrid thing because I can't fully use ECS in JavaScript. So might as well don't go too crazy and and make a hybrid system. So this is like this is part of a hybrid system as well. Um, now we're going to start dealing with our transforms. Um, so I'm just going to quickly just let me go to the shader. So 
Remember I said I have a new, U, a new UBO? So here's our UBO model. So when I'm rendering, I'm going to be updating this UBO, and the model view gets over there. So there's very little change. So all my, all my shaders, this is the only shader I updated so far. So there's four more shaders I need to uh, update and modify to use the uh, UBO model and just plop it in the right spot So and take out the uniforms. Um, but everything else is about is the same. Uh, I have it, at the top. I have to say to load in the UBO model, it's, so it's a lot easier. And I have to say um, this shader uses the model matrix. I still need this attribute to say, hey, this shader needs it. So when the renderer goes through and sees that the shader needs it, it then loads up the data to this UBO. All right. So that's our shader. So uh, that's done. And uh, let's go to our transform system because it's e the easiest, simplest one. Uh, so I create a constant with an array. So this way I'm going to constantly recreate this every time this updates. So it's, it's a constant. And when the system runs, it does a query. It tries to find all the entities that has the transform object. And it just checks to see if it's modified. If it's modified, um, I just make a shortcut to the transform so I can access the data uh, easier. Um, I set the is modified to false. I do, I create the model matrix from out of it. You know, I take the, I, I pass in rotation, position, and scale, and say save all the data to the model view. And instead of creating a system for camera, because it's kind of silly to create another system just to run for one entity, and camera is essentially just really a transform mostly. So I just added in here an if statement if. The com of the if a camera uh, component exists, invert the model matrix and save it into inverted world matrix. So this way, that becomes our um, view matrix for our shader. So that's the only caveat here is like I added it in there just because I don't want to add an extra system in there. So my transform system also updates my camera information. Uh, and then the last system, which is kind of a biggie. Uh, the render system and the render system is basically the same thing as our render object and I actually might end up pulling this out and building this again as a render object and have the render system use it but I built it as the system itself um, so there's like I said this is really almost the exact same functionality except for some ch small changes like we remember options um, instead of just dealing with UBO transform now I'm dealing with two UBOs um, the update function. During the update function, I update the UBO, uh, the main transform that gets the camera stuff, the camera position, global time. Like I said, it and this is different. Before I used to say update, 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 and call it a day and unbind. This one I do update, update, and the update to GL because I'm like I said, I'm modifying the binary, uh, the byte array, and then when when I'm done modifying that binary array, I just upload that entire binary array to the GPU and call it a day. So it actually makes it nice. Not only is it more efficient, it makes for cleaner code because I had to bind and then unbind. And so, again, uh, some of this might change. This stuff is kind of still in flux, but overall it works. So we're, we're going to query, and we're going to query for anything that has a transform and a drawable. It needs those two components for this system to function correctly. So once we have our entities, we're going to clear our frame, and then we're going to loop through. We check if it's it's active. Um, then we go check to see, uh, get a references of uh, our um, of our drawable. Does it have a VEO? Does it have vertices to um, to render? And if it does, I load up the material. I load up the entity, which just loads up. Uh, I think it loads up the VEO and. Uh, options all these are pretty much the same um, I'll go through them one by one. so basically I load up material load entity and then just draw boom um, I use R for drawable because originally I did call it renderable but then I decided to rename it at the last second because I want I don't want to write renderable so much so, so I have a lot of references to R which means the rendering object but it's a drawable so Sorry for that little bit of confusion. If that makes that makes no sense, especially since this using these single letter things is a no no. Uh, but like since these functions are very small, and as long as I use something that makes sense, like E for entity, R for 
originally a renderable. I should probably rename ours to D's, so this way you know it, it's the drawable. So that's the update for the system. Load shader is the same thing. All we do is just load a shader. Uh, material, nothing has changed. Load materials is the same thing. Uh, load options is the same thing. Nothing has changed really. Um, load entities. It's slightly different. Like before, I had load a uh, renderable. This one's load entity. Um, I check the sheet. I check the shader to see if the model view is required. If it is, I updated it. I also this is not implemented yet, but also check to see if it needs the normal matrix. So I kind of add to true if the USB has UBO has changed, and if the UBO has changed, I upload it. Remember, I I don't upload right away anymore I actually modify local data so that's why I kind of had to have this little state saying if I if I modify low um, uh, model matrix and e if I modified either one of these then I want to upload the data and then I just load options that are part of drawable so th this drawable has options and then the draw function is practically the same thing I just load in our VAO bind it depending if it's an instance if it's an indexed if I, which function do I use and when all said and done that's it that's all it is and that's our render system and then you know, we're back here and this is how we set our camera we're going to create a grid floor and the grid floor is now a little bit different so we have uh, you know we, we a new assembly because we have a draw object we're going to give it the name f f um, that grid floor changed so I added so it has a VO function it just creates all the data. Before, it would create the VEO and then create a rendable and return a rendable. This time, all my primitives are now just going to return um, VAOs, just the VAO data itself. Um, and this makes it easier in the long term because I can kind of just load up a bunch of primitives. And then I can just say a fungi get VAO based on the name and just load it in that, that way too. So it, so this way we can um, preload um, models and things like that and just call them in with VAOs later on. So it makes it a lot easier. Uh, just basically how I did how I did materials here. So I have materials, and I just say fungi get materials, get that material name, and just loads it right in, nice and just easy for you. And all I have to do is call update systems, which then handles the transform, all the transforms, and it handles all the rendering systems. It runs all together, and when I click refresh, I have the grid floor, and the camera is rotated to where I need it to be. So if I want to switch this up to 40, click refresh, it the camera change rotates. Now, this is one of the things I don't like about ECS or, or I guess functional programming is in not actually not functional programming, but how ECS works. That you have to you create your entity and then if you want to update your um your 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 components you, you sometimes you have to do it like this manually so this is a lot of work for me I don't like this I don't like this at all so but in true sense of functional programming you write a function and you pass in the data object and it just handles it so I have a function called draw new draw which does exactly what this does so you pass in the name the material the VAO the draw mode and the optional call face and it handles all the logic and returns back out the entity so this one so new draw pass in the information face uh, face the cube has a VO function to creates the VO um, into the global cache and returns the the reference to the object and that's it and now I have the entity I can access its transform component to set position and uh, if I click save refresh and there's our cube now I can't rotate because right now I don't have a render loop set up and I don't have user input set up and that's the segue for the next video the next video is going to be handling user input because we're going to need to handle user input differently in the ECS system because we can't handle we can't use events very easily in this everything is very data driven and data needs to be handled in a certain way but here we go we have transform systems and we have rendering system everything's not working and now we c we're almost back to where fungi U was working before so i'm going to end it here for now and um i'm going to let my uh it's actually really hot today uh and my mixer overheats and i already lost the video because i, I have i have to give it like 20 or 30 minutes to cool down else my mixer will then just 
totally screwed the audio on my video. So I'm going to try to do all my videos today, and then um, hopefully everyone can then learn ECS next week or something. I don't know. So please like and subscribe. It helps my channel out. Ugh, I hate doing this, but please, you know, thankfully, please help me increase my channel. Uh, like I said, it's the only thing I'm doing right now because I'm unemployed. So it'd be nice to be able to make this a a job thing, but probably it's not going to happen, but whatever. It helps. Um, if anything, maybe this channel can help me find a new job. If you're hiring, I'm available. <laughs> if you're looking for a programmer, software engineer, I, whatever. So, yay. <laughs> so I see you guys in the next video when we start um, doing more, we'll start building out more of our ECS uh, framework into our fungi game engine.